Today, we live in a world filled with chocolate. In America, we eat chocolate bars, chocolate cakes with chocolate frosting. We munch chocolate chip cookies, drink chocolate. We drip chocolate syrup on our ice cream. We use it as a sauce and as a spice mix. Chocolate is everywhere. But have you ever wondered where all this chocolate comes from? Or how it became so common in our society? Today, chocolate is typically produced on modern assembly lines in large quantities. These advanced processes allow chocolate to be shaped into all the different forms we enjoy in our modern world. But did you know that George and Martha Washington also consumed chocolate? Well, what we eat today is pretty different from what the Washingtons enjoyed. For one thing, it was not possible to just walk into a store and buy a candy bar. Sometimes Washington had to wait weeks to receive his chocolate orders. It also tasted very different. Chocolate in Washington's time contained no milk or sugar. And during the 16, 17, and 1800s, chocolate was mainly served as a beverage. While there are many differences in how we eat chocolate today, the way we make chocolate has not really changed. Historians believe the creation of chocolate goes back more than 3,000 years to the Olmecs, one of the earliest Mesoamerican civilizations. The Mayans and Aztecs were responsible for the cultivation of the cacao tree, meaning they purposely planted more trees to increase the production of chocolate. In many early Central American civilizations, chocolate was used during religious ceremonies. The Aztecs even used it as a form of money. Historians believe chocolate was first introduced to Europe by Christopher Columbus. And while he was the first to bring cocoa beans to Europe, the Spanish king and queen were originally not very interested. However, when Hernán Cortés brought the beans, recipe, and equipment for making chocolate to Europe, the Spanish court took notice, and chocolate's popularity began to increase. In 1580, the very first chocolate processing facility was built in Spain. The factory turned cocoa beans into blocks of chocolate. These blocks were then sold at very high prices and ground into powder to make a hot chocolate drink. This new, expensive beverage quickly became prevalent in the Spanish court, and soon after spread across England and France. Its popularity meant chocolate quickly became part of the global trading system. Let's find out just how chocolate was made in the 1700s with Sam Murphy, manager of historic trades at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Hi, Sam. Hi, Laura. I'm delighted to be able to show you how chocolate was produced in the 18th century during George Washington's life. Now, I know that chocolate starts out as a plant, but how does it go from being part of a tree in Central and South America to a chocolate drink on the Washington's table? Chocolate begins as a tiny flower growing on the trunk of the cacao tree, and little insects called midge flies pollinate these tiny flowers. What is pollination? Pollination occurs when insects or, or animals transfer pollen grains from the male anther of the flower to the female stigma. Once pollinated, these flowers will grow into pods. So without midge flies, there would be no chocolate? Exactly. <laughs> As the pods grow, they rise up the trunk and along the branches of the tree. When mature, the pods are carefully harvested, split open, and the 30 to 40 cocoa beans inside are scooped out along with a sweet tasting pulp called baba. Oh wow, and these beans are what gets turned into chocolate. They sure are. Mm. And now during the next step, fermentation, the beans and pulp are laid into pits lined when covered with banana leaves and left to ferment anywhere from two to eight days. Mm -hmm. During this process, the yeast in the air mixes with the natural sugars of the pulp and a chemical reaction occurs. The next step is to dry the beans. To properly dry, the beans are laid out and exposed to the hot sun and turned regularly for five to seven days. This causes the moisture content of the beans to drop from about 60% to 7.5%. So after drying, the beans are transported to chocolate mills in the American colonies in Europe? Yes. Mm -hmm. The chocolate that George Washington and others in the 1700s ate came by boat from Central and South America. They're coming to the northern colonies. When the beans arrive at the mill, the second stage of the chocolate making process begins. 
During this stage, the beans are transformed into blocks of chocolate. And how does that happen? Well, the cocoa beans, when they arrive at the mill, need to be roasted. Once roasted, and we're looking for a medium roast, mm -hmm. we will need to remove the outer shell. So you remove the outer shell, and then we end up with the roasted cocoa bean. Wow. What are these little streaks of silver? That is the cocoa butter. Now that roasted cocoa bean is equal parts cocoa butter and cocoa solid. We're gonna take that and we're gonna put it into our mortar. This is a mortar, this is a pestle. The next step is to take our roasted beans, put them into our mortar. Go ahead and add your bean. <laughs> we're gonna break these beans down into what are called nibs. The next step is to take the nibs that we've ground up in with our mortar and pestle. We're gonna lay it out onto this matate and using a combination of heat and friction, we're gonna break down the cocoa solids and melt the cocoa butter. Is that because heat causes a chemical change when it transforms a solid into a liquid? Exactly. After we have brought this back into a chocolate liquid, a chocolate liquor, we're going to take a mold and we're going to pour this now silky smooth chocolate into the mold. Once the chocolate is set up, you pop it out of the mold and now it's ready to ship to the consumer. Like George Washington? Yep, the people just like George Washington. However, chocolate was also affordable to most people living in the American colonies. Because of the American colonies' proximity to the cacao plantations in Central and South America, they enjoyed greater access to chocolate than those Europeans. It took anywhere from about a month to almost three months, whereas travel up the east coast of the American colonies would only take a few weeks. Wow, I had no idea. Americans have had a love affair with chocolate for a long time. Both George and Martha Washington loved chocolate. Washington ordered blocks as small as one pound mm -hmm. up to orders as large as 50 pounds. These blocks were shipped by boat to the Washington's home, Mount Vernon, here in Virginia. So what happened after the chocolate blocks arrived at Mount Vernon? Well, remember, chocolate blocks were not eaten like a chocolate bar is today. Brenda Parker, a character interpreter here at Mount Vernon, has joined us to show us the work and expertise that went into making and serving chocolate for the Washingtons and their guests at Mount Vernon. Now, once the chocolate arrived at Mount Vernon, it was taken to the kitchen, and enslaved cooks such as Lucy would have grated into a fine powder. Next, she mixed the powder into a special pot just for hot chocolate with a hot liquid such as water, milk, or even red wine. <laughs> now the liquid needed to be very hot so the chocolate powder dissolves, creating a new solution. Well, kind of like how we make hot chocolate today. Exactly. Oh. The scientific process is very similar. Yes, but the taste is not. <laughs> the drink was naturally very bitter. Well, after the powder dissolves, what happens next? Well, while the liquid was still very hot, Lucy could have dissolved a variety of ingredients in to personalize the taste, creating a new mixture. Sugar was added most often, and other common ingredients included um, nutmeg or cinnamon, anise, a licorice flavor, and of course, annatto for a reddish hue. The annatto gave it a red color, which is different from today's hot chocolate. After Lucy put everything in the pot, she used a tool called a dasher to create a frothy, thick, delicious beverage. She then poured the drink into special cups for chocolate and passed them off to an enslaved manservant, such as Christopher Shields. He then served the drink to Washington's and their guests. When did people have this drink? As a dessert? Well, 
at Mount Vernon, it was most common during breakfast or any time coffee and tea were served. Was chocolate only served as a drink during the Washington's time? But while chocolate gained its popularity as a beverage, it also sometimes was used as an ingredient in desserts, such as meringues and chocolate-covered nuts, and by the end of Washington's life, in ice creams. How do we know so much about the chocolate people enjoyed over 225 years ago? In large part, it's due to research done by historians with primary sources, such as letters and receipts. Here at the Washington Library, thousands of documents from the 1700s are available to researchers. Today, Special Collections Librarian Catherine Horn has a few documents from Washington's life related to chocolate to show us. We know the Washingtons purchased and consumed chocolate because of primary sources. Mm -hmm. um, so these primary sources can include anything from pages from account books and ledgers, uh, receipts and invoices from purchases made, as well as correspondence that mentions purchasing chocolate. There's two examples of that in front of us. This is an invoice from the President's house in New York City. Uh, mm -hmm. This is from 1790 and it's an account with a man named Joseph Coray who was a confectioner in New York City. Um, and he's actually one of the first people who's known to have advertised selling ice cream. Um, and so the Washingtons went to him for all of their ice cream needs. What can we learn about the ingredients necessary for making ice cream from these receipts? Well, what's great about this receipt is that it lists item by item every single thing that the Washingtons purchased for the presidential household. Uh, so this includes listing for cream, it includes a listing for ice, and it includes listings for sugar. And those are the three main ingredients for ice cream. And then this document here is a letter from Martha Washington, uh, written in 1794, and in it she mentions purchasing chocolate. In this letter, amongst other news, Martha specifically writes that she has sent the chocolate um, to Fanny Bassett from uh, Captain Mitchell. Now with Fanny Bassett's at Mount Vernon, where is Martha Washington writing to her from? So this letter was written in 1794, mm -hmm. and in 1794, George Washington is the president, and the president's house is in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So Martha is writing this from Philadelphia. And what's great about this letter is that Martha dates the letter, and she also puts that she is writing it from Philadelphia at the top of the letter. Um, that information is not always on correspondence, so it's really great when it is, because it makes it easy for us to date the document and locate it. So we know from the letter that Martha writes that she's sending the chocolate by a man named Captain Mitchell. It's possible that he, he would have delivered the chocolate um, by carriage. This would have been very common in this time period. If you lived in a place like Mount Vernon that wasn't close to a major city, if you had friends and family in a large city like Philadelphia and you wanted to acquire a luxury good such as chocolate, you would often send to family and say, hey, could you send me some chocolate? Um, and that's exactly what Martha is doing for Fanny. So what have we learned about chocolate? It has a rich history dating back over 3,000 years. Originally used as a Mesoamerican drink in religious ceremonies, as well as a form of currency. Chocolate comes from the pod of cacao trees. The cacao tree's flowers are pollinated by midge flies, and then fertilized flowers grow into pods. Through the use of heat and friction, multiple chemical reactions occur, which are necessary to create chocolate. Chocolate was part of a global trade network, connecting Central America, South America, Europe, and North America. Chocolate first found its way to Spain, then spread to other European countries as a drink only the wealthy could afford. Most American colonists regularly enjoyed chocolate, including George and Martha Washington. Enslaved cooks like Lucy ground up the chocolate blocks to make a drink for the Washingtons and their guests. Primary sources from the 1700s help us understand how chocolate was eaten and transported. So the next time you enjoy some chocolate, remember that while what you're eating is very different from the chocolate George and Martha Washington enjoyed, the process to make it has not changed all that much. <laughs>